So I'd like to, thank you, Emily. I'd like to bring Vale into the conversation now, um, going from print and performance. Um, since we both worked at City Lights, we both had the pleasure of knowing Philip Lamantia, who was a surrealist before he was considered a beat and was also a huge, huge influence, at least on me, I'm sure he was on you too. Um, if you could talk a little bit about, you know, taking Emily's lead and, you know, kind of jumping into that place of cross-pollination that was City Lights. You know, after all, Ferlinghetti and Ginsburg helped with Search and Destroy. Um, oh, you mean my phrase, uh, the cultural, counter-cultural con continuum. Exactly. Yeah, <clears throat> sorry about this. Um, it was only, you know, Peter's done this wonderful Dada festival, which, you know, puts the searchlight on what was original about Dada in terms of, I think, being, quote, revolutionary. Do I dare use that word anymore? Yes. And, um, and sort of permanently subversive. And um, I, I, I had always thought that, for example, that Burroughs and Geisen were the ones that kind of invented the cut-up and all that. But I was shocked that Kurt Schwitters did cut-ups with scissors, and then that's how I got the word <laughs> mares, you know, just from doing so, so there was a lot that happened for the first time with Dada, but it, it was used, Dada, those people were using, of course, I have a phrase that first technology, then culture, and there was, we haven't always had the time of mass-produced uh, sort of beautiful magazines and printing technology available. And, and there were magazines, but not a hell of a lot, I think, before Dada. And then Dada, of course, being anti-authority and, and, and black humor and um, against the status quo and all that, well, they would, how would you, how would you do a critique of these beautiful magazines that present this gorgeous reality in ads and things. Well, you'd cut them up, of course, and you'd do collages. And, um, and it's, that's the cheapest way, especially if you don't have any drawing talent or ability, uh, to, uh, say, produce a punk poster, you know, that, that was a critique and funny and yet had the power of the original images, but destabilized with your subversive message. Like, I'm sure Penelope here must have made a poster or two, right? You must have. Yeah, one right there. He's wearing, Winston has on his shirt Winston there. Nice. Show him your oh, shirt, Winston. Oh, oh. Show Stand up and show him your shirt. Oh, Edward Munch. Yeah. Ooh. Uh, yeah. Okay. Pretty hairy picture to begin with. And <laughs> I'm sure you didn't have permission from the estate <laughs> for the scream, but it, uh, an iconic image. So I have to talk about myself a little because I think I accidentally personify certain things like, for example, my father was a beatnik and my super influential uncle was a beatnik, but he was, these are like some of the only Asians in, in, in the beat scene, and they really didn't go down in history. My, my uncle was lucky enough by chance to fight, kill Germans, I guess, in World War II, like Ferlinghetti, and um, they were both in the same painting class, apparently at either the Sorbonne in Paris or whatever it was on the GI Bill, which is a wonderful thing. And they became friends, and uh, they both moved to San Francisco. My uncle sold Ferlinghetti a lot in Bolinas, if you can believe that, for $3,000. <laughs> I hate to think what it's worth now. And, um, <clears throat> and so, more to the point, you can't do anything without money. And it was first Allen Ginsberg and then Lawrence Ferlinghetti, who each gave me a $100 check so I could do the first uh, publication on the rise of punk in San Francisco. And I want to emphasize that everything in life is personal 
And I, I swear, those first two years, the scene was so tiny, you really knew everyone's name, at least if you were me. And that, well, the reason me, I say that is because a, a lot of people did want to get into Search and Destroy at, when it was going, and so naturally, they have to meet me. <laughs> and so it was like, I felt lucky, and the one, I made huge mistakes as an, an amateur anthropologist, historian, philosopher, I wish I had I'd started a database of every single person with their parents' contact info, because <laughs> this is pre-internet. Yeah. I would have loved to have a database of every person as they joined and the day they joined punk. Don't you think that would be amazing <laughs> to look at now? now there because, is. because there are it was because there was such a variety of personality and artistic achievement and and everyone really was encouraging i called it i called it the punk rock ages ago i called it the punk rock international naive art movement naive art meaning that you don't have to have academic training or any kind of experience to start making posters which are they should be funny after all <clears throat> and and to start a band and you could play a bass for, I guess, a week and then st write a song and then start a band. And it's pretty amazing that you had that freedom which was made possible. And this is the thing I took f for granted until, you know, 10 or 20 years ago that if you want to have a club, the first thing you need is a clubhouse. No clubhouse, no club. And we were just so lucky that this Mabuhai just happened to show up and be a really super tolerant, <laughs> generous host. You know, the Filipinos, not, not white people ran it, Filipinos. And, and they, maybe they didn't quite comprehend what was going on, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, <they're, laughs> but they were very tolerant you know, and very hospitable. I think it's in the Filipino culture. There so were the spaghetti nights, too. which were Oh, there was free spaghetti, but it was, you know what they did? It was horrible. <laughs> I never ate it. Uh, they over-salted it. So then you'd be forced to buy beers. And, and you're talking to someone who doesn't drink alcohol, never has. And, and so, um, anyway. But, but yeah, yeah, it was generous of them to do that. They also had, they also had over-salted popcorn. I don't know if anyone remembers that. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, you could, if, and also the, 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 bear, the bar of entry was, was about dropped to the floor in punk. I mean, in terms of, of training, social privilege, advantage, cultural background, all that. I mean, you really could. There was a really awful band that didn't really take off. Only Bruce Connor and I saw them, and maybe a handful of other people. I don't know if you saw them, Penelope, but they're called Ointment. Do you remember? Yeah, you don't even remember them. <laughs> That's because they, you know, for, for, all our, for all our talk about how, uh, you know, Punk, punk was this and that. There was still kind of prejudice against lower class white trash people who are really white trash. And this, these people were like from the Ozarks or something. I mean, you had to have heard, I think I have a tape I made of them, but you, you, you had to have heard this, this vocalist. I mean, the punks did not like them, <laughs> quote punks in the room. I mean, I did, because I'm, I'm an outsider. But um, anyway, the, the point is about punk is that it's super important that, to remember that it's, it's all about black humor first. And black humor is just mockery, making fun of anything that represents authority, like Trump, whatever. And um, it, that's first, I think the mockery of authority, authoritarianism, whatever words you want to use, no matter where you find it. And secondly, it's do it yourself. But of course it's stupid do it yourself because nobody is gonna do it for you. 
<laughs> Believe me. <laughs> I mean, that's a given. And, of course, I like the phrase, anyone can do it. And um, I, I, I also think that the third uh, missing principle of punk was mutual aid. Because, believe me, no one had any money, and it was not cool to work a full-time job <laughs> for the man, or whatever you call him. I mean, you, you, you are proud of working as little as possible. <laughs> it's kind of different from the Silicon Valley startup, in which they're, you know, slaves. They've conned these kids into be, being 160-hour-a-week working slaves, you know. But, but, of course, some of them become billionaires, so can you blame them? But um, but but this is a different startup situation <laughs> in punk, in which um, and I especially liked it when I met Mark Pauline in 1978, and he told me about his his plan to do SRL, and I said, God, you should do it. I told him I'd seen a Tingley show in New York City you know, with the, all these rusty machines and stuff, but the idea of adding explosives and fire, I mean, that just seemed really punk. <laughs> and he did it, and he's still undercredited, I think, for the huge mammoth scale of what he pulled off historically with no money. I mean, though, you can see the videos free on, on uh, YouTube now. Ooh. We have uh, three of the recordings that are going out on YouTube. So they're on SRL.org. SRL.org. SRL.org has them all. But, yeah, up, go upstairs and see Penelope's uh, display and curating of whatever is in the vitrines, right? Didn't you have a lot to do with that? Thank you. So I want to I want to bring John John Law into the into the conversation a little bit since we brought oh, up SRL God. and wait. but also billboards. Wait 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 wait. Because Mark Pauline was it. was definitely into billboards and I know that um, John yeah, knows a little bit about billboards too, having having been involved with BLF and uh, and a whole bunch of other stuff, which uh, basically involves detouring, mashing, jamming. Improving. You know, c improving, thank you. <laughs> improving <laughs> images that are meant to commodify life, but you know, kind of turning them on their ass a little bit and having fun with it. So, um, yeah, I guess, um, well, how do I talk about this? The Billboard Liberation Front was a group where we would uh, go out and take over uh, usually large scale, massive freeway billboards. Um, I got the idea from a group called the Suicide Club and uh, Gary Warren and Adrian Burke, who did an event that uh, where we went and improved two billboards up, up on top of a big free, uh, building alongside the freeway, and uh, we did it with 26 people, and we had animal costumes, and you know it took a really long time. We had to vote on what we're going to change the cop caption to, and like the, a lot of the things in the Suicide Club, we didn't have any clue what we were doing. We were completely re retarded about it, and. So we got caught, of course, all 26 people and 25 people in a gorilla, yeah, anyway. So I thought, well, this is interesting. You could go up on a billboard and just make it say whatever you want. And being an 18-year-old uh, juvenile delinquent, um, recovering juvenile delinquent, I thought, this is pretty cool. And so, but I thought we should do it with like four or five people like dressed up in black and like not get caught. And so David T. Warren, uh, who uses uh, the name Irving Glick, and uh, Jason Wechter used the name Simon Wagstaff, and I started the Billboard Liberation Front. And uh, where we would go out and improve these billboards, and we would change the messages. And over time, it developed. We developed into what I like to call it, uh, a, a gratis advertising agency, uh, helping Chiat Day and o Ogilvy Mathers and the other big copywriters to do better work for their clients. And we did. We altered billboards for 34 years, and we were anonymous. We had we wore masks. We do talks in museums and shit like that, and ma wearing masks. Nobody, ostensibly, nobody knew who we were. And we did that for 34 years. And you know. Um, other artists came along, you know, doing this sort of thing. We didn't invent it. We didn't invent, you know, fiddling with uh, advertising. It had been done before. And the 1970s was a, a rife with this sort of thing. There were all kinds of groups doing, uh, doing this sort of thing, taking over advertising surfaces and, and using them to say what they wanted to. A lot of the punks did this sort of thing. The only real difference was that we did press releases with them and made up a whole phony organization. And we would say things when we talked to the press, like there were 350 members. We were all, most of us were advertising executives and we were sort of expiating our guilt. And they would print this shit in the newspaper, which taught me something really interesting, that newspapers will print pretty much anything as long as 
it sells more, you know, beans or tampons or cigarettes or whatever they're trying to sell. And uh, so we did this for 34 years anonymously, and then other artists came along, uh, Shepard Ferry, whom I've met and who I admire, and Ron English, who's been doing billboards for a long time. Banksy came along, and uh, Banksy was anonymous, probably still is, and everybody wanted to know who Banksy was. We've been doing it for 34 years, and nobody gave a shit, so we finally retired. <laughs> so, <laughs> which is okay. But, um, but the idea was that you could, t you could take an advertising campaign that uh, some corporations spent an enormous amount of money on, and with very, very little effort, make it say something completely different and, and change the concept, the idea completely. And most importantly, putting that idea in someone's head because you don't need to dress up like ninjas and climb up a rope and swing around on, you know, like, uh, on, on these billboards at night, uh, risking your life and limb and being, getting thrown in jail to, to, to change these, uh, these massive advertising messages. Um, in order to get in a dialogue with them, all you have to do is change the message in your head. And that was an idea that I kind of really liked and we t tried to develop and talk about a little bit. You know, or a kid with a crayon could go onto a subway and change what, you know, the little advertising messages said. If everybody did that all the time, you wouldn't be spoken to by these advertising campaigns. You'd be in a dialogue with them, which I think is a much better way to deal with this constant input. And, uh, you know, Billboard Liberation Front, old, old tech, old technology, it's kind of old hat you know, last, last millennium uh, sort of thing. But um, people are doing this sort of thing constantly all the time. There are groups that do it in all media. Um, Negative Land is a wonderful group started in the, uh, uh, in the 80s, late, uh, early 80s, that uh, actually coined the term culture jamming. They're a music uh, cut-up group that uh, very data-oriented, surrealist in, their, in, their, in the work that they put out. Big an influence on all kinds of future uh, mashup groups. Um, in visual art, imagery, uh, and all this stuff owes a, owes a great debt, I think, to the Dadaists, the only uh, art movement of the 20th century that I give a shit about because it was anti-art. You couldn't really commodify it. It was difficult, if not impossible, to commodify. I mean, I know they sold the urinal finally, but, you know, I mean, you got to keep ahead of them a little bit. And the group that I fell into when I was a juvenile delinquent, the Suicide Club, uh, which opened up a whole world to me, being you know, headed to prison basically at that time, I realized you could do this sort of thing. You could fuck with things and you could really change your environment and, and fuck shit up, like the punks would like to say. But if you had a song in your heart and you were doing it with a, with, with a real uh, sense of uh, a joy at, at, at making something wonderful in this shitty, stupid world that we live in where we have this orange Ubu Roy clown as president now, you know, it's like, how, what do you do? I mean, you got to get fucking mad and angry, but... But if you're not having fun, and if you're not doing something that's fun and funny, you might as well just quit or kill yourself, I mean, frankly. So you got to laugh at this shit, or else you'll just pull your teeth out with a pair of channel locks. Um, and so that was what the Suicide Club represented to me. It was a group where we didn't know what we were doing. We'd, somebody would have an idea. We'd go, hey, let's uh, get dressed up and, you know, uh, like as animals and go try to, and, and Keystone Cops, and go try to uh, deposit fish at a da Bank of America, um, you know, and see what happens. Let's uh, take over the let's take over the elevators in Union Square parking lot, four level below ground parking lot, and put a different scene in each one. You know, including a gorilla with four people bound and gagged hostage on the floor with a, with a gun. Uh, another scene was uh, a, a spaghetti dinner with a young couple sitting at the at the table eating a spaghetti dinner with a violinist with a top tail top hat and tails playing music. So when these elevator doors would open up, people would see this cr incredible scene. Of course, would go to the next of the three elevators in which there would be another scene. And uh, culminating in uh, David T. Warren, one of the founders of the Suicide Club, doing his fire eating act uh, out, out of the door as his uh, lovely assistant held the door open. So I remember I was in the f shower scene in this elevator. Two uh, little old ladies in, uh, down shopping in Union Square didn't really look in the elevator before they stepped in. And they walked in this elevator where there were three naked people with towels around their waist waiting in line to get into the shower, which was half of the elevator. I was behind the curtain you know, with a little bathing cap on and a uh, tape recorder, a cassette tape, which is a little box machine that you put this little plastic thing in and it made music. And, uh, and, it, had, and it was playing Running Water. And, uh, and I looked over the curtain. I said, oh, ladies, you're going to have to take your clothes off and get in line like everybody else. So we kind of changed their day, their reality. They, they got something out of that. I don't know what. Um, but that was the idea. So, and this is, we, were, we weren't actors. We were stupid. We were ridiculous. Our street theater was pathetic when we started doing it. It was really bad. But we were doing it to challenge our fears and to do that kind of thing. And the Dada influence on the Suicide Club was, was real. And, and I knew nothing. I had no history. I didn't come from a m musical or um, artistic background at all. I was a juvenile delinquent, but I happened to fall into this group, thank God. And uh, 
Uh, uh, Gary Warren, who's a primary source, the primary avatar for this group, was highly influenced by the Dadaists and the fact that they were, he hated art. He hated commodified art and how, how you could buy and sell fucking anything. Suicide Club came out of a group called Communiversity, which is part of the free university movement. He believed some shit should just be free. S not everything should be commodified. Not everything. And so that's what we did. You know, our events were free. We did them for ourselves. And if somebody else liked them, that was great. And if they didn't, tough shit. So it was cor correlated to the punk, punk scene in that, in that sense, I think, although it was a much smaller thing. And uh, I don't know, we weren't musical, but I don't know. Any other questions? Uh, you know, I'm, I'm immediately reminded of, well, number one, uh, how the, both the Berlin and the, the Paris Dadaists really were very media savvy and knew how to mess with the media. And then the next thing is like, I think it was either, it was either Eve Klein or, or Tangele who used to steal uh, construction equipment, get them started appropriate, and run them. Appropriate the equipment. Appropriate, liberate. appropriate, liberate, thank you. Liberate uh, construction equipment and run through the Parisian streets, like dig digging the streets up. Um, so I think these, <laughs> we see these, <laughs> these, again, these threads that kind of like. They were helping. <laughs> helping, thank you, even better. Um, why don't we open it up for, um, Comments, uh, questions. Um, I have uh, a comment. Oh, please. <laughs> I think a thread that's read, run through almost everyone's uh, comments was uh, not needing to go to school, and I think the uh, Dada's nothing against school. I went to school, um, but you survived it, Cal. Uh, <laughs> sort of, and and the Dada's ran with this. Started this, I think, was not needing talent and not. You know, needing schooled talent, but um, having an idea and a passion and not giving a damn and going for it. And that's empowering. And it is a workaround of our society that tries to capitalize everything. And what a gift these people 100 years ago gave us that anyone can do stuff and leave the world a little weirder. Oh, you know, I was shocked. Yeah. I was shocked to learn from, from your festival, Peter, that the founder of Dada, the person who invented the word, was only 20 years old. And it w also that the first, uh, I guess, official startup date of Dada was William Burroughs' birthday, February 5th. Oh. 1916, and so I just immediately saw a connection that I'd never seen before, thanks to your <laughs> festival. Uh, oh, yes. Well, we're working on that right now. Um, I'm working with a bunch of young artists, like in their 20s and 30s right now, on a Dada related thing. Um, and that most of them had never heard of Dada before, and they've all, they're all about, you know, like, 300, 400 pages in a, at least one book about it. They're, they're so excited about it. And they were already doing super cool stuff. I mean, amazing stuff. Can't talk about it, really. But, uh, <laughs> but, but you know, introducing them, you know, thank you, by the way, Peter, for doing all this. Thank you very much. It was an amazing, amazing festival. No shit. And they are digging it so hard. There's like 40 of them, 30, 40 of them I'm working with. And most of them, like I said, they'd heard of it and they knew a little bit about it, but they didn't really know much. And now they are just obsessed with finding out more about that movement. Yeah. I'm, I'm working with some hackers, <coughs> and I, I feel like if I was younger, I would have, I'd be a hacker. And I feel like they're tapping into some other level stuff, and uh, it's pretty exciting. It's a skill set. I don't have any, I'm, I, I, I don't have that skill, so it's fun to collaborate with them. Yeah, uh, I think Alfred Jarry, um, it wasn't just his work that was an example. I mean, his life was an example. And I think that 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 pataphysics, I mean, there wouldn't be a data without pataphysics. I mean, it would be a different thing. And I think that it really kind of set the course and got a lot of people very inspired. And uh, so, essential. Um, John, I'm curious if you have heard about this group of young people in New York who've been doing very
Do you know the name of the group, Julie? It's like a broken record. I'm not, I don't know, I'm not familiar with that particular prank, but there have been several groups in, in New York that are doing really interesting stuff right now. There's a group called Wanderlust Projects, which is kind of at the end of their iteration, their, their first iteration, and kind of moving on to doing some other things. But they're doing things like taking over uh, public spaces and using them for uh, these, these ongoing events. Um, uh, abandoned spaces, much like we did in the Suicide Club, and much like people in the second, uh, you know, Egyptian dynasty snuck into buildings in the first from the first Egyptian dynasty. But you know, it's not like we invented it. But there, there are groups doing that right now, and very smart events, really different in certain ways than what what we did in the 70s and 80s. And uh, uh, there's that group. Uh, the, uh, well, I mean, you know, the best known group that's doing street prank stuff's been around for a long time, which is Improv Everywhere, Charlie Todd's group, which does the uh, flash mob. You know the note pants subway ride and uh, the yeah oh improv every yeah improv everywhere yeah you're talking about improv everywhere yeah yeah they've been out for a while and they do some really funny funny pranks using uh, large numbers of people connected through the internet and through uh, you know texting and setting up these uh, theatrical scenarios uh, like a, 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 what is a, um, Grand Central Station having like 500 people come in and all stop moving ex the exact same second and just stand there. Like statues. For that was one of the, one of my favorites that they did. But that that kind of thing. Using the see, they're using the current modern uh, technologies and the, and 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 concepts that uh, you know we used to uh, used to communicate you know with bongo drums and smoke clouds and things like that. And they have the internet now, so uh, and they're using it to to great effect to uh, to do pranking and to connect with other people, in, you know, in, in the real world in the meat space, as they say. Over here. for Winston. Winston. <laughs> I don't know if I understand the question. Aesthetics. I can't even spell that. <laughs> well, usually, you know, for for the the punk rock era, which the reason I was so drawn to it is it reminded me very much of my exposure up to then of the Dada era. And thought, finally, you know, this is finally coming back. This is like refried Dada, and um, you didn't have to paint like Rembrandt. Uh, I mean, I can draw and stuff, but I prefer to cut up other people's drawings. And, and um, it was more like instant, you know, surrealism. Um, uh, I can't think of any parallel there is with music except maybe, um, you know, freeform jazz or you know, non-structured music. Um, so the good thing about the 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 art art side of the punk scene, which in San Francisco was more of an art movement than it was music, I think, say as opposed to New York City or, or Los Angeles, where it was more performances and 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 less you know graphic work, um, was that you didn't have to have an art degree to to do things uh, like, like John was saying, just changing a couple of letters in, in an ad completely sabotage the meaning of it. Uh, I think, you know, how satisfying that was for the um, people who didn't have the $10 million to launch a, an ad campaign for, you know, Coca-Cola or whatever it was, to have that altered just a little bit and ruin their hard work. Um, By now it could be, it's, that's 30, 35 years ago I'm talking about. So maybe after, um, you know, it's like I say, if you've lived in a place long enough, uh, say after 30 or 35 years, then you can be an unofficial native. Um, so maybe um, um, the new version of the Dada movement has been growing for ha nearly half a century, as, at least since after the war. and. Um, and also, we have even much more um, graphic imagery uh, available to sabotage. I mean, that's why people could do it in the 19-teens, was the uh, 1900s, is suddenly there was a vast available market for people with you know, books of pictures, adverts, um, newspaper adverts. Uh, people didn't ever have that before. Before the 1880s or 1890s, mass... Um, 
you know, they had newspapers, but they didn't have adverts of color. Yeah, and then color changed everything, and 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 suddenly you had um, uh, trademarks of you know Betty uh, Crocker and and um, the RCA dog, and you know all these little things that you could put together, you know, properly illegally. Uh, but that was also part of the thrill uh, to uh, do it covertly and. Um, and maybe make a new meaning every time someone sees the RCA dog. Now they're going to have, a, you know, they're going the dog is holding a hand grenade or something. Uh, um, and and that once the idea is in their head, it can't be taken away. You know, it's um, you're planting a um, um, a seed that will grow into a great oak tree. If I, can add I think also that aesthetics determine consumption. I mean, that's one of my three-word aphorisms. And I think, when you think about it, I think certainly the punk rock cultural revolution that I'd like to think I lived through Survived. had a huge aesthetic, you know, upheaval. I, I don't want to use that word disruption. That, that's a Silicon Valley word now. And also, it was, it was too ugly to be co-opted by the mainstream. We kept thinking. I don't think it was ugly. Although, <laughs> wait, wait, wait long <laughs> enough, <laughs> then everything. Well, gets there wasn't an, pro, an anti-aesthetic approach that was considered ugly by the mainstream, and that was purposefully done, I think. Yeah, because uh, the flower power stuff of you know the 1960s and 70s. They got turned into um, uh, Kleenex boxes and, and, and orange juice bottles, and it was too pretty, too agreeable, too nice, and nobody wanted some skanky punk rock. I don't know about there. that because, I mean, a whole corporation called Hot Topic with a zillion stores sure. and malls started up. But that but took a couple you're decades. A, you're in a city a too much. That was too. a lot later, though. That was a lot later. Yeah. Oh, it, it, was, it was later, but not that much later. Only 20 years. Wait a, gen wait a generation and everything can be remarketed, yeah. Well, aesthetically, I, I'd also like to chime in and say, uh, you know, I think the element of surprise certainly in Dada and in many other movements, was very, very important because this is how you shock people sometimes, and this is also how you, you know, once people become accustomed to, like, you know, when we were designing the, the, the posters and the postcards for this whole festival, I didn't want to recreate that kind of cliched, kind of letterpress Dada type thing. I figured, can we do something that will still capture people, but, you know, in a different way, which I, th I think we, we, we succeeded at. But I think the element of surprise is, has always been something, whether it's Dada or whatever, all the way through to now, that if you can produce something that kind of somehow shocks somebody, you know, they have a different response. So that'd be one more question. It's kind of the bastard child. Well, we're going to well, find well, out pretty soon. We're talking about technology, I think, because because just the just the just again the signature, I think, art invention, communication media, whatever you call it, of Dada was the collage, and that's also the signature. It's still the signature, um, I think, you know, graphic art um, co contribution that punk. I put the word in quote marks, you know, as known by. I mean, I'm just, I'm just looking at all the stuff that's out there in the zines and in the punk posters and the album covers and all that. I mean, you can't, you can't afford to hire Winston. Well, you can actually. Yeah. But Unfortunately, <laughs> you can't cheap. afford to hire Winston. <laughs> make, Shouldn't be able to offer. afford. Look, Green Day, Green Day got him. They, yeah. they paid some money. Didn't you make more for that one piece for Green Day than all the other stuff put together or something? It then had to pay 30% uh, taxes, uh, which, of course, Donald Trump wasn't paying his taxes, so I did. Yeah, well. <laughs> yeah you need but, his tax attorney. But to, to, to go to the question of the Dada and then the punk scene and the next iteration, whatever it might be that's coming, there's a common denominator. I mean, there are many things that, uh, you know, were character that these, uh, these groups uh, characterize, these movements characterize. But one thing in common was extreme fucking anger at bullshit that's going on in the larger world, the military and the government. And the next iteration that I can feel coming right now is going to be that, and it will have that in common with it. And you can't just, I mean, it's like a lot of protest stuff. If you're, if you're not having fun, if you're not having a lot of fun fucking and it, just running around and running amok and really trying to say something, why, why do it? I mean, if you're so fucking serious that you have to uh, you know, be as 
ugly as the as what you're attacking. That's not the point. I mean, the point is to make fun of them and have fun while you're doing it. And so the Dadaists did that. I mean, they were facing the world of mechanized warfare, this brand new fucking thing where these horrifying monstrous corporations had come up with ways to mow down people by the tens of thousands. We have our drone warfare stuff. We have, it's just it con continued on. I mean, it's just as ugly now. And this stuff needs to break out, and people need to respond to that. And art, you know, that's why Dada was, to me, the only relevant, really relevant art movement of the, of the, of the century, and all the ones that were, had any relevance that came after it came, were influenced by it. You know, and, and, and the unifying factor was, you know, a, a non-commercial bent and, uh, and not playing the game, not, not choosing to just make objects for sale, you know, and responding to this horrible world, you know, and, and there's so many parts of it that we should try to make better through art and whatever. I also think it's an attack on logic because logic is so overvalued, you know, in, in our mass media at least. But, you know, it doesn't really make, nothing really makes sense in a weird way. I Another mean. key ingredient is poverty, I think. And when you're poor and angry, oh, yeah. how do you have a voice in the society? And that punk gave yeah. that to, to the youth. And Dada did the same t thing. I mean, this was a group of people in Europe that were literally hunted down and chased off of their continent. And a lot of them survived the war. They saw mustard gas. What was it? The Poles charged the Germans on horseback, and the Germans mowed them down with machine guns. And there was this Napoleonic noble way to, for some uh, uh, warring factions to go into war with your chin up and charge forward. And, and that, was, that caused a lot of PTSD. My, my grandfather fought in World War I, came back with PTSD, and that's how I explained my art to my mother. She was so upset with what I was doing, and, and I talked about how uh, politics can radicalize you and change you, and then you want to have a voice. And when I connected that to her father, she kind of, for 10 minutes, got what I was doing. <laughs> I, I mean, as far as the youth, you know, uh, as everyone's been saying the past two days, wow, I can't wait to see the art that comes out of this. And, and uh, or we might all be in the same uh, d um, uh, detention camp. <laughs> so I hope we, you know, bring your glue sticks. <laughs> well, <laughs> as always the optimist, Winston. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, as Vale said, you know, there was, there's communities and you back each other up and you yeah. get a posse and you support each other. And that's it's, what we need to do now. It's very much and like when the night that Reagan was uh, elected the first time in 1980. Mm -hmm. And um, a friend of mine came over to my studio and I was sitting there just looking <laughs> at the wall. And he didn't say anything and I didn't say anything. We just looked at the wall for each other. And he said, well, I guess uh, all we can do now is that it's up to us half-old farts to get out there and raise hell and you know, fight back, even though it was eight years later, no, 12 years later before Reagan and Bush were out of the White House. But uh, I was mortified when Reagan got elected the first time. I thought it was the end of the world. I I, a clown actor got elected. Yeah. I, <laughs> We've I, improved so much since. Oh, we've, come, <laughs> we've come so far in now 36 I'd go twice years. For, for Reagan, if I could get him to. So, gang, I have a séance to host in about 20 <laughs> minutes. So, I got to take go. off. But please continue. <laughs> um, I, I think we got we got to end it. We're a little out of time. But thank you, thank you to the panel. Thank you to Penelope for helping host this, and the San Francisco hey. Public Library, and to all of you. There are uh, three more days left to Dada World Fair.